Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome to our time here together, in which we'll be turning to the Christian mystic Thomas Merton for guidance in deepening our experience of and response to God's presence in our lives. The passage I've chosen for this session is the second chapter of part two of Thomas Merton's book, Thoughts in Solitude. By the way, if you've not yet had the opportunity to read Thomas Merton, and if you're inclined to do so, Thoughts in Solitude is a great way to start. It's a very short little meditations intended to be used for daily prayer as, as Lexio Divina, a spiritual reading. And the passage from Thoughts and Solitude I've chosen for today uh, in this chapter Thomas Merton says, My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. To reflect with you on this passage. What I'll be doing here is um, sharing with you what I see in this passage as I s listen to it as my own spiritual reading. And uh, so as you listen to what Merton is saying and you listen to what I see in it, it might help you to prayerfully sit with and open yourself to what you see in the passage, how it personally touches you and how it personally helps you in your spiritual path in your, in your daily life. And I think it's about this particular passage is that the intimacy of the passage is that Merton is inviting us to listen in as he prays to God and uh, to realize that he's, as he's doing so, he's offering us guidance that will hopefully help us in our prayer and in our daily life. And uh, it is in this sense then that uh, we're sitting with his words and I'm sharing these words with you that you might sit with your own inner unfolding path and see where the path takes you. And what strikes me uh, about this passage and <clears throat> in this session, I want to limit myself to the first opening words of the text, uh, my, uh, my Lord God. And this will segue in the next session into the remaining words of the passage, segueing into the next text that we'll be looking at together, <clears throat> the spiritual path that Thomas Merton marks out for us. <clears throat> what strikes me about the passage is, uh, is the sense of quiet confidence in Merton's words, that as he speaks to God, he knows and he trusts that God hears him. Merton said somewhere, he said, in the spiritual life, to know is to know that you're known. And we would say, too, that to speak is to know that you're heard. And uh, so the, the, another, another word for it, I think, to my mind, is <clears throat> kind of Merton's guiding us in a certain kind of attitudinal stance that we can look for and foster in ourselves. I think we might call it devotional sincerity. Thomas Merton once said, with God a little sincerity goes a long, long way. 
that Merton's words have a, that they're heartfelt. Uh, they're heartfelt. And, and I think, too, this, this sincerity, this heartfelt sincerity echoes a sense of God's infinite sincerity towards us that we see embodied in the teachings in the life of Jesus. In the teachings of Jesus and all that he said, there's no posing or posturing. There doesn't seem to be about it anything that's contrived or manipulative. Everything comes directly from his heart in this kind of sincere devotional sincerity and devotional oneness with God that resonates in his words and carries over into us, awakening our sense of being in the presence of God. And so another way that I would look at this as we, as we keep opening this up here together on the nature of these teachings, the subtlety of these, intimacy of these teachings, is that there's also a feeling for me then in this prayer that there is within Merton, we might say, an, an intra personal awareness of subsisting in an interpersonal communion with God. The intrapersonal meaning it's within him, it's innermost within himself, but what's innermost within himself is his interpersonal communion with God, that he's, he's subsisting in God, like light subsists in flame. He's in a state of this communion with God, this oneness with God. You know, the Cistercian Order, the, the Abbey of Gethsemane where Merton lived as a monk, uh, <clears throat> was a reform. <coughs> <coughs> was a reform of the uh, role of St. Benedict in the 5th century. And, uh, <coughs> take a drink of water here. <coughs> And in the prologue, the prologue, the first sentence of the prologue of uh, the role of St. Benedict is, listen, my child, to the words of the Master. If today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And uh, uh, the thing about monastic life is everything about the life is designed to foster and to protect, we might call it a, a state of sustained attentiveness infused with love of this deepening communion with God. And, um, and so when I was in the monastery for nearly six years in the silence of the monastery, I was immersed in this contemplative culture devoted to cultivating this deepening state of communion um, with a sense of fidelity to that communion reaches out and touches the whole world in ways we don't understand. So when I left the monastery and came out here, where we all live, 99.9% .9 of us live, uh, it was, I, I still wanted to live a contemplative way of life to which I was introduced in the monastery. And on the retreats that I lead, the people come to these silent contemplative retreats. They think they come to because they desire that also. And the, the situation is, is that we, we, uh, we do not live in a contemplative culture. Uh, the Zen master Sh Shunru Suzuki says, uh, he said, you know, it would be so much simpler if we were asked to be simple in a simple world, but we're asked to be simple in a complicated world. And so we're, we're being called upon here, our own heart draws upon us here to become a contemplative man or woman in a culture that is uh, in many, many ways not contemplative. We have to foster and cultivate this contemplative consciousness and Merton in this passage, the tonal quality of his words kind of gives us experiential entrance into this, the subtlety of this, uh, this sense of um, being in the presence of God, speaking to God that God hears us. I want to say something too, and this is where this is, these words kind of touch right on the edge of spiritual direction. I, I know there's times in my life I could easily say that I, I could speak to God and, and I'm not necessarily sure that God hears me. At least I can't feel that God hears me because of the stress of the moment or different things. And in spiritual direction over the years with people, I think for a lot of people, they're, they're not certain at all 
We may not be certain at all that God hears us, or even that God exists. And so how could we apply this passage to um, that? By the way, there are other passages in Merton which we'll be looking at where he himself expresses this doubt. Jesus felt this doubt. My God, my God, dying on the cross, why hast thou forsaken me? And, um, and so how do we then bring this doubt um, into this sense? And I think it's this, that if I have this doubt, I sit down in prayer, a little sincerity goes a long, long way. But there is this doubt that God hears me, even if God exists, maybe. So personal all of this is. So then be sincere in telling God about your doubt. That is, let your sincerely expressed doubt be the way that you enter into this interpersonal communion with God, uh, which is the kind of the integrity of your doubt that's open and receptive to where this openness might take you. Like, I believe, help my unbelief. So this is his stance then. Yeah, I think his, he, he's inviting us, a lot of the teachings of the mystics are these teachings to cultivate this uh, stance, this interior stance that we're attempting to bear witness to here. And what does he say to God? He says, he addresses God by, my Lord God. And I, I'd like for us to look at this, pay close attention to this. First of all, God. I think Merton here too is echoing, you know, Teresa of Avila in the interior castle. She says to the sisters in Carmel, 16th century Spain, uh, she says, sisters, you know, when we talk to God, we should be aware who we're talking to. So Merton is a Christian monk was very aware here when speaking to God, he was aware of who he was talking to. That is, he was speaking to the one who in the opening words of Genesis and saying, let there be light, speaks light into being. See, God's, let there be light, let there be stones and trees and stars, let there be you, let there be me. That God is speaking, God speaks, he's speaking to the one who speaks all things and speaks him into being. Once in the monastery, uh, Thomas Merton um, giving a talk to the novices, and he says, you're speaking of creation, and he said, you know, he said, it's always, we should always keep in mind that creation is not something that just happened in the beginning, and God goes off to let the universe run to it on its own devices. But he said, creation is going on all the time. Um, creation uh, is a perpetual act. We might put it this way to me, it helps to put it this way. It's an act in which the infinite presence of God is presencing itself. That is, it's pouring itself out and giving itself away, whole and complete, in and as the gift and the miracle of our very presence, the gift and the miracle of others, the gift and the miracle of all things. This is not to say that we are God, that the world is God. To the contrary, it's to simultaneously affirm our absolute nothingness without God, that if God would cease loving us at the count of three into the present moment, at the count of three we would disappear. Because we're nothing, we're absolutely nothing, outside or other than the infinite love of God pouring itself out and giving itself, holding complete as the gift and miracle of our very life. But it is our very nothingness without God that makes our very presence to be the presence of God. So too with all created things, this is brother sun and sister moon. This is the holiness of the material world. This is the divinity of all life seen through these eyes, like this. You know, uh, <clears throat> to be at the deathbed of a dying loved one, it's, it's tangibly clear that our next breath belongs more to God than to us, lest we be presumptuous. Yes, we, were some, we didn't bring ourselves into existence, and it doesn't lie in our power to maintain ourselves in existence. Our ongoing gift of existence is the generosity of God being poured out as the miracle of our ongoing existence on this earth. And Jesus called this, this infinite generosity, Abba, Abba. See, God is our Father. See, God is our Mother. That is, God is a loving, a, a, a deeply loving, infinite presence, presencing itself and pouring itself out uh, as a reality of ourselves and of all things. So that our destiny, 
the, the, the dignity of ourselves as persons, is not as human beings that we have the gift of reason that distinguishes us from the animals and so on, it's, it's with all the dignity of, of reason of the mind, the conceptual mind. But the deepest dignity is our God-given capacity to see this, see? is, is to, to be awakened to it, which is spiritual experience, which is the gift of faith. And um, and so there is in Merton then in his writings, and he's so steeped in the scriptures and the tradition. He has this deep, reverential sense for the for the mystery of God and God. We live and move and have our being, and he's now sitting in the presence of God, uh, opening up his heart to God to renew and deepen his his awareness of that communion that is life itself. And then when he says, Lord God, my Lord God, is Lord, see, Lord of my heart. You know, in the Seven Story Mountain, which is Merton's spiritual autobiography, kind of echoes uh, St. Augustine's, the Confessions of St. Augustine, this mystical memoir, spiritual memoir. Uh, he tells the story of how at Columbia University, kind of a wild young man in his wild days, how God so mysteriously accessed his heart and God, how, how God awakened him, see, and uh, in him a desire for God. They led him to the monastery. He led him to the monastery where he could seek and find and give himself to God, who with each breath and heartbeat is completely given to him and to the whole world. <clears throat> and so I think here's another thought, I think, for us here, is that, you know, in so far as you're drawn at all to this path, which would be, I guess, what motivated you to listen to reflections like this. You could ask yourself, well, how did I get on this path? That is, how, is it, how did it come to pass that I've come to be the man or woman who is sensitive to such things or has such longings? And if we look back to the very origins, the mysterious origins, is it not so see, that there was, a, there was a person where there was a moment where there was an event in which this awakening first began to emerge in a conscious, felt, lived way. And maybe with a lot of uh, cul-de-sacs along the way, a lot of uh, circuitous, uh, misguided adventures, uh, here we are sitting here right now like this together, like this, uh, on this path of being led right up to this, of this moment. So I think here, I'm what I'm suggesting to you here really is we turn to the mystics for guidance. The guidance they give is not a method, it's not a technique, it's not a, not at, not a, at a certain level there aren't methods of prayer, active contemplation, we'll be talking about that in these series, but it's, but it's not a method, it's not a, do a set of dogmas, it's not that. The, the essence of the matter is um, something deep within our heart that Merton, in his own sincerity and sharing it, it arcs over and accesses into our heart and awakens so there's a certain resonance that happens between our heart and Merton's heart and God's heart, which is, which is really the teacher of Thomas Merton to do this. See. And um, so I, I think this way, in, in a very practical way then for us here who don't live in mon by the way, this isn't necessarily easy in monasteries. Um, for us out here, um, uh, the, the situation we face is that um, uh, we get caught up in the momentum of the day's demands. That it's, it's hard work being a human being. There's so many things going on. And you somehow can get the feeling that there's something missing in this. In, 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 the, in the complexities of sorting out and achieving and attaining and maintaining and all, all of that. It's, it's not easy. And there's a sense that we're lonely for ourself. That is, we're lonely for the depth of ourself and the depths of God, or put it another way. We get this feeling, this uneasy feeling, that we're skimming over the surface of the depths of our own life. And that this tendency is all the more regrettable, and that God's oneness with us is hidden in the depths over which we're skimming. You know, as a psychotherapist, and being with people in psychotherapy, and going through my own psychotherapy, 
So it seems to me that a lot of psychotherapy is being in the presence of someone who keeps inviting you to slow down and listen at the feeling level to what you just said. See, not to just um, skim over the surface of the depth that waits to be discovered and pausing in a state of sustained attentiveness to these stirrings within our heart. <clears throat> And um, so, uh, I think um, we're already into it here. See, we're already into this, like setting the tone of cultivating an attitude of our mind and heart. Now, the thing is, of course, that another thing I think, a practical thing that we all face is that the that that which is essential, namely this love of which we're now speaking, which Merton is speaking, see, that that which is essential never imposes itself, for love is always offered, it's never imposed. That which is unessential is constantly imposing itself. Okay? And so we have to create a contemplative culture in our heart by committing ourselves to a daily rendezvous, to a daily quiet time. And these, these sessions together are intended to serve this purpose, like one, many possible ways to do this. See? So to define, uh, what is a meditation practice? In this broad sense, a meditation practice, we could say, is, any, is, is our commitment to any act, which when we give ourselves over to it with our whole heart, it takes us to the deeper place. So our practice might be tending the roses, might be the long, slow walk to no place in particular, uh, fidelity to a quiet hour alone at day's end, being vulnerable in the presence of that person in whose presence we're taken to the deeper place, renewed commitment to a community of people. And, and so we, there's this daily rendezvous, a kind of a hiatus, uh, in the momentum of the day's demands, to slow down enough to catch up with ourself, to be present to um, ourself in the presence of God. And um, that, that's the essence of this Lexio Divina, this spirituality, this language that embodies us and invites us to this. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> So we've, we've, we've set the tone of this whole series here of all the mystics, which was, God willing, kind of, we'll see what happens here. <laughs> but um, uh, we set the tone. So we'll then we'll be ending in our session here then with, uh, with meditation. And again, let me say again the guidelines here for the, the, uh, the meditation. <clears throat> and this is the guidelines that I use when I lead contemplative retreats. That I'm going to be... Um, inviting you to sit, to sit, and so if you're driving your car, for example, you're obviously you're gonna pull off to the side of the road or wait till you get home, or it depends on whether you, you create a space where you can give yourself to this. I invite you to sit still, uh, to sit straight, uh, to fold your hands in prayer, and to bow. The Soto Zen Master Shunru Suzuki says that when we bow, we give ourselves up. If ever you get to a place in life where the only thing you can do is bow, you should do it. So as contemplative women, as contemplative men, the least and the most we can do is bow in a kind of liturgy of the body, a kind of deep gratitude for being awakened to this ancient path of love, this ancient path of, uh, of endless liberation. And then in bowing, I'll say from the Psalms, be still and know I am God. And you'll read silently within yourself, you whisper it, repeat after me. See? Then I'll take off one word each time, repeat after me each time, repeat after me each time, till I just say the word be. Then I'll ring the bell three times. <clears throat> At the end of the sitting, uh, the meditation, I'll ring the bell once, and then we'll bow. And then when we bow, uh, bearing witness that we're here in the mystical lineage of the Christian tradition in concert with all the mystical lineages of all the world's great religions, uh, we'll slowly say the Lord's Prayer together. And then I'll say, Mary, 
mother contemplative response would be pray for us. He's looked on his servant in her nothingness. Henceforth all generations will call me blessed. That's an archetype of the contemplative soul. And I'll name two Christian mystics, the response to which will be pray for us. See? And in this bow at the end, and in this prayer, see, we're also expressing at the end of the meditation that it was more than enough. It's always more than enough, as poor and as fragmented as it might be. In, in the sincerity of our heart, it's always more than enough, sustained by the love that loves us so in uh, our wayward ways. So, uh, and of course, too, um, here in the recording, the meditation will be very short. Uh, but on your own, as you listen to this again, or each time you listen to these, of course, you'll extend that meditation for as long as you're uh, uh, inclined to do so. Often for beginners, it really varies. Sometimes three minutes is good. But a norm as you kind of get into this is about 20 minutes for a sitting. It, it's, it's, it's short enough to be practical with the demands of the day, but it's long enough to begin to settle down into this deeper uh, place this kind of uh, devotional sincerity in the presence of God. <clears throat> so with that then I invite you to sit straight, fold your hands, and bow. Repeat after me, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know, be still, be. say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Mary, Mother of Contemplatives, pray for us. St. Francis, pray for us. St. Clair, pray for us. Thank you. Blessings to all of you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Center for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions, so if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.